Welcome, everyone, back to the School of Greatness podcast. Very excited. We have the legendary Larry King in the house. Thanks for being hey, here. Hey, Louis. Happy to be here. I'm very excited. We, we met at um, John Astaroff's dinner party a couple of months ago. I don't know if you remember this, but it was at Wolfgang Puck's place. I remember it very yeah, well. Sp- Spago, right? Is that the place? Yeah, and, we had uh, that dinner. And you had were, the dinner. You were one of about 10, 12, 10, people. 12 people. Yeah, and we got to ask you a lot of questions. And, yeah, uh, it was a nice I, booking. It was great, the, yeah. The exactly. guy paid me. There you go, the to have dinner. Says, How would you like, I'll give you this, and you'll come and sit and have dinner, and 10 people sit around and ask you questions. So I said, that's <laughs> what I do every day. <laughs> exactly. And I remember thinking. That was fun. It was fun. I remember thinking, I wish I had my podcast set up to record this whole thing because the conversation was incredible. Yeah, it was very funny. and It was, it was great, of, yeah. And Wolfgang came in and said yeah. hi and told stories about what you guys used to do back in the day or whatever. So, um, first off, thanks for coming on. And uh, I want to acknowledge you for the incredible work you've done. You've inspired me so much. I think you've inspired every interviewer in the world. So well, I can't, I tell you the truth, John, I can't believe it myself. I uh, <laughs> No, I do. I pinch myself a lot. Uh, you know, I, next May 1st, I will have been on the air 60 years. 60 years? Yeah, I think I've done 60,000 interviews. I, uh, oh, my God. I always wanted to be a broadcaster. I used to dream about it when I was a kid, when I was five years old. Other people wanted to be you know, doctors, lawyers, firemen. I wanted to be on the air. I didn't think I'd be an interviewer. I finally got into it in Miami in 1957. Uh, I thought I would be a sportscaster. You know, I loved going to Dodger games. and But uh, it worked out that I went from being a disc jockey into doing a show at uh, a restaurant. and. Mm. Started interviewing people and I loved it. I was so at home. Really? Interviewing. Yeah, I didn't have. We didn't have any guests booked, so I never knew what would. Every day was a surprise. You know, I just people coming in one day. Bobby Darren walked in, Jimmy Hoffa walked in, Danny Thomas, and I got to interview these people. I didn't plan. I didn't know they were coming, so I got to like the immediacy of it. I loved working live and not I let, planning it. Not planning. I couldn't mm, plan. Right. And then it went into television, and we started booking guests, and then. I did radio and t- always did both my whole career. Always did radio. Did started the first national talk radio show on mutual broadcasting. That was in 1978, and then in '85, Ted Turner came and hired me for CNN. Hmm. And then I did the first worldwide talk show. So I was kind of like a pioneer. And then uh, four years ago, uh, I hooked up with uh, Carlos Slim, mm-hmm. one of the richest men in the world at the time. He was the richest. And uh, he financed uh, our site called Larry King Now on Aura, and it was my wife's idea. And so we got this talk show on the internet, just started our fifth year. I do a podcast with my wife, Mm -hmm. which we will have you on. Love to. And then, uh, just, I saw I'm going to be 82 years old in November, and I can't, I can't believe, I don't feel 82. I don't know where it all went. <laughs> I mean, where did all the years go and all the, pe- the people I've interviewed? And I think of people come up to me and say, you know, I heard your interview with Count Basie uh, 60 years. Wow, Count Basie. Yeah, I interviewed Count Basie and Ella Fitzgerald and Louis Armstrong, all those people. <laughs> Seven, eight presidents. You know, and it, it's still. You've interviewed eight presidents. Yeah, you know, it's, wow. still, it's still a hoot to me. I still love, still love doing it. I still love asking questions. I also love comedy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, when I do a speaking, I only speak and tell funny stories. I do not speak seriously. <laughs> uh, I worked a lot of conventions. Tony Robbins, that's where I first saw I worked, you. I worked on Tony Robbins. Yep. I worked on other those self-help things. And I always go on and say, what am I doing here? You know, I don't have any <laughs> books to sell. I don't have nothing to sell. To. Right. And I just tell stories. And Tony's wild to work with. Tony used to introduce me by starting on the stage and taking L. Give me an L. Give me, an L. and then he'd run <laughs> through the audience, go up to the balcony, run across the balcony, you know, spelling out my name, until he got down until finally Larry King and I. I said that uh, I think we ought to put a rocket up his rear <laughs> and shoot Tony up to the clouds. He will not be happy. Until we sort of blast him off to Jupiter. Sure. But I had a lot of fun with Tony. And uh, so I like doing this. In fact, that's one of my favorite things. To go out on a bare stage, there's nothing like the high you get 
when you can make people laugh, when you can walk out cold, nothing behind you, no script, no play, no mm-hmm. guest, just go out. So I did a comedy tour two years ago. We worked Boston and Miami and all over the South, and uh, it was just great just going out on stage. We we knew where we were going with it. It was right. directed, but uh, a lot of times it would be ad-lib, and I I just loved it. I loved going out there, and a lot of my friends are comics, and I've always admired comics. Mm-hmm. I love interviewing comics. Comics see the world differently. Mm. They see things funny, you know. So what is funny, funny? What is not funny to most people can be funny to comics. And I've learned a lot from that. I learned timing. Yeah. You know, I, I learned, you know, like certain certain cities, like Mel Brooks told me, there's certain cities that are funny. <laughs> What's the funniest city? Albuquerque is funny. Really? <laughs> Why? Albuquerque. It's funny. Chicago isn't funny. Oh, no, just the sound. Albuquerque. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, It's yeah. funny. You know, yeah. <laughs> Houston is funny. Okay. Dallas isn't funny. I don't know why. I'm just. <laughs> you, it, you don't even have to agree. Sure, it's sure. It's just part of the whole makeup. What's the What's your favorite joke that you love to tell? Or the uh, old, I've got. If you, could, if you could only tell one joke, what's yeah, the one I, you would I, want I, to? I, tell? It's some of the most recent ones I've heard. Well, I'll give you two. Yes. Uh, there's a train that goes every night from New York to Chicago. It's an all Pullman train, all sleeper. Leaves New York at one in the morning and gets to Chicago at ten in the morning. Guy checks into his compartment, and suddenly the door opens and a woman checks in. Now normally Amtrak would not sell single woman, single man to spend a night together, but the, it was the last seat on the train. The woman insisted she had to be in Chicago. So they said, okay. And she got into the lower berth. The man got into the upper berth, and the train began its trek. Mm-hmm. After a little while, the man leaned over and said, I'm a little chilled. Could I borrow a blanket? The woman looked up and said, you know, we're never going to see each other again. We're on this train for one night going to Chicago. We've got nine <laughs> hours together. Why don't we just snuggle up a little? Huh? Why don't we... Why don't we play man and wife? You and me, man and wife. The guy says, sure. She says, good. Get your own goddamn blanket. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good and one. And the other one was, uh, <laughs> those are funny. Yes. Uh, <laughs> this, uh, in Oregon, this uh, company that chops down trees is hiring people to chop down trees. A foreman is interviewing people. And a one-armed midget shows up. Mm. A midget with one arm applying for a job as a tree cutter. And the foreman says, you got to be kidding. He says, no, I can chop down trees. He says, okay, here's an axe. Go out there, and there's a bunch of trees chopping down. The midget goes out, carrying the axe along the ground, picks it up, and whack, 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 knocks down 20 trees in a minute. Whack! He comes back. The foreman says, you are the greatest tree cutter I have ever seen. You're hired. You're unbelievable. You're a one-armed midget, but where did you work last? He says, I worked... The Sahara Forest. He says, you mean the desert? He says, well, now. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. See, that's funny. The timing. Yeah, yeah. Leave him going this way, going that way. That's funny. I like that. I love jokes. That's cool. Um, who was the greatest comedian you've ever interviewed? Who made you just... was so? Well, was I have so or... many great... You know, the, from the Don Rickles to the Bill Cosby in his prime was a phenomenal comedian. Jerry Seinfeld. Hmm. But if I had to pick one guy to be really funny... Is Mel Brooks. Really? He's 90 now. But he did the producers. He did, you know, the, that great Western movie. He did He did Young Frankenstein. But his mind, he did the 2,000-year-old man, which is the funniest comedy album ever made. I was sent it first when I was in Miami, and I got to play it first. And I, never, I didn't know who Mel Brooks was. I knew Carl Reiner. And it was about an album about a guy interviewing a guy who's 2,000 years old. And all of it was ad lib. Mm. And I put that on, and I fell on the floor. Wow. And I used to, I, I would play it with Mel when I was with him, you know. Two, you'd ask him anything about 2,000 years. The guy lived 2,000 years. Sure. And it, I started to listen to it, and he said, you're a... He says, we're here at Idlewild Airport, and a man is arriving who claims to be... 2,000 years old. Not yet. So I'll be 2,000 October 23rd. What was a 
What was your first language? The rock language. The rock, rock language. language. Can you give me an example? <laughs> yeah. Hey, don't throw that rock at me. Are you crazy? <laughs> and then went all the way to talk about Shakespeare and all that. Anyway, yeah. he's still that funny. Yeah. His mind is that quick. So I would say, he's a, cool. Rickles puts me on the floor, too. It puts me on the sure, sure. Rickles. My wife opened for Rickles in Vegas and Atlantic City. Mm. And he's just, he's been kidding me <laughs> for 55 years. Sure, sure. What is it about people that still fascinates you? 60,000 interviews later, why are you still fascinated? Uh, the word, I guess the word I would use would be passion. I have a passion for curiosity. I am I'm not the kind of person you want to sit next to on an airplane. <laughs> because I, <laughs> if I, you want to sleep. Yeah, because I, <laughs> I want to just ask questions right. all the time. And that has never left me which is why I love sports so much because I feel sorry for people who aren't sports fans because when I get up every day, like tonight there's 15 games in baseball. Yeah. I don't know who's going to win. Right. <laughs> the wonder of it, who's going to win, what they do, what did he do, what did he do, what happened, who got traded, wow. So I love sport. I love asking questions, mm. but I also love the curiosity. Who's going to win the election? It's pretty know. fascinating right now. Yeah, but the whole thing is is a wonder. I know everybody involved. You know, that's mm -hmm. part of You've it, You've interviewed too. both of them, I'm oh, many, many times. times. I, I you know, know Donald really well, I'm Very assuming. well. Yeah. I know Hillary very well. I, yeah. know, I know. So all the... But the curiosity... I flew about six months ago from New York to L.A., and on the plane was the president of Audi, the motor car company. Uh -huh. I drove him <laughs> crazy. <laughs> I learned more about cars, building cars, how cars are sold, what they want you to do when you buy a car. How, it was unbelievable. I'll give you some things. Ready? Sure. Always find out the day your car was made and never buy a car made Monday or Friday. Because on Friday, they're anxious to go home, mm -hmm. and on Monday, they just got back. Right. Best day is Wednesday. Hmm. Middle of the week, they're totally into they're making sharp. They're in the flow. If you're buying a car, the best way is to have cash. They want you to buy on time because the dealer makes half the money on the interest. The bank makes half the money and the dealer gets half the money and they're charging like 4 or 5%. Right. They don't want to pay. Guys. They want, they, you know, you're going to buy. So you go in and tell them you're financing. You know, you're gonna, you might need 48 months, maybe 56 <laughs> months. Okay, so this price is fifty three. I could bring it. I could, oh, I could bring it down to forty seven thousand for you. You're gonna do forty eight months, so it's forty. It's forty seven. The price, cash. <laughs> right. <laughs> you beat them. Right. You know, but these are all little things. I, I, I would, I would ask him about my, why, are, why are there lemons? How come cars? Now there's the anti lemon law, which never was before. You know we have an anti lemon law. What is that? You get a lemon, a car. You get a new car. Really. If they can't fix it, they've got to get you a new car. That <laughs> never was in the past. Well, they, get, they keep trying. They give you a loaner. Sure. Now they got to fix it. they got to fix it or give you a new one. Okay. I like that. These are little things I learned in the by, passing of life. By asking questions. You know, so I never learned anything when I was talking. That was my motto on the air. So I asked short questions. you got to be a good listener. Often an answer brings a question. Yeah. And if you're a good listener and you stay focused and you're naturally curious, interviewing is a great way to make a living. And you don't really prepare for your interviews. You never did. Really. Well, I, what I do is I'll go over some notes, you know, naturally right. with CNN. You're doing a worldwide interview and you're having a senator on. You'll go over some notes. Right. But no, <coughs> preparation, I don't do six hours or sit around. Watching videos. And <laughs> because I never wanted to ask a question I knew the answer to. So if I read so much about you, you already know everything. I already know everything. It's the opposite of the criminal lawyer. The criminal lawyer never wants oh. to be surprised in court. <laughs> so he wants to thoroughly know what's going to be. If he's surprised, yeah. he's done something wrong. Right. I want to be surprised all the time. Hmm. Where did that curiosity come from? Don't know. My uh, my brother's a lawyer. My father died when I was uh, nine and a half years old. He he was a, a refugee from Austria. He tried to enlist. He couldn't enlist, so he was working in a defense plant. 
He was very funny. I remember that. I got it from him. I, I remember him being very funny. And my mother was a, a housewife, a wonderful woman. He died when he was... So I don't know where I got the curiosity yeah. from, but I, I always had it. I had it in school. Even though I wasn't a good student, I impressed teachers. Mm. I wasn't a good student because I, I didn't like being tested. I hate this. I I was a pretty good student before my father died, and then after that I sort of coasted. Mm. Who was more influential in your life growing up, or the most influential person, your mom, dad, or someone else? The radio. The radio was my life, so I, I listened to all the Arthur Godfrey's who I gave, later got to know, and the broadcasters of the Edward R. Murrows and the newscasts I listened to, the timbre wow. of their voice. It had a great effect on me because it was a every day. We didn't have television. Right? Television right. came in like 49. I was born in 33, so I was 16. When we got our television set, I was 17. Hmm. So everything I got was through the mind and through the ear. So I was very attuned to voices. I still, I, I hate texting. Right. I want to hear. You got the old school flip phone. That's what I have. The can't really phone. text that easy on can't that thing. Text. I don't text. Well, I can receive a text. Right. But I, I, to me, it's like, I know it can be important in emergencies. Sure, sure. But it's mostly a cop out. Yeah. You can say no. You know, you don't have the answers. I, to me, I'm, I'm a, I'm a communicator. Yeah. And I love the art of communicating. That's what I do with my course. I have a course called yep. The Art of, uh, what is it? what's the title? The Secrets, Secrets of, of Great, Great Communication. With Brendan Burchard, right? He's yeah, Brendan Burchard. And it's yep. called Larry'sCourse.com. You can go to Larry'sCourse.com. It's 10, 10 different courses. Cool. All based on my book, How to Talk to Anyone, Anytime, Anywhere, which is still in print. <laughs> and uh, so I try to help people through this course yeah. learn how to communicate. Because the biggest fear, the biggest fear people have is public speaking. Biggest. That's bigger than it's any challenging. of fear of flying, fear of getting up in front of an audience. And like, I tried. Were you ever afraid to, to speak in front of public? Or the first time until I learned. Mm. I learned my first day on the air. Right. How wh how to use it, and it was it was so simple to me. I was nervous as hell. <laughs> uh, my name was Larry Zeiger. I had wanted to be in broadcasting all my life. I'm in Miami, living with my uncle, and I get a job at a small radio station. Uh -huh. Very small. What now. year is this? 19, 1957. Okay. Be, be 60 years next May. Wow. And they hire me, and they say, you're going to be a disc jockey. You play music, and you'll do news and sports in the mm -hmm. afternoon. you got to work all day, $50 a week. And I'm starting on a Monday, and the whole weekend I can't sleep. <laughs> I mean, I'm up and I'm planning my records, what I'm going to play, what wow. I'm going to say. I'm looking in the mirror, good morning, good morning. It's unbelievable. Now it's the first day, May 1st, 1957. It's quarter to nine. Didn't sleep all week. weekend. Now I'm up, ready to go. And the general manager calls me in, Marshall. Marshall Simmons, great guy. And he says to me, Larry, this is your first day on the air. We wish you the best of luck. It's a great Great business to be in, and we got a you got a nice voice. We think you can make it. I said thank you. He said, now what name are you going to use? And I look at the clock. It's ten to nine. I go on at nine. What name are you going to use? I said, well, I, he says you can't use Zeiger. It's too ethnic. Hmm. People won't know how to spell it. You need, now they would now you now you'd have the name. Uh, if Engelbert Humperdinck could have the name, right. I could have it. So <laughs> Schwarzenegger, you're right. Uh, yeah, of course. So. Uh, he says, your name is Larry King. And you know how he got it? He had the Miami Herald open, and there was an ad for King's Wholesale Liquors. Wow. And he says, how about Larry King? I says, okay. I later, I legally changed it. Sure. And now I go in to go on the air, and I cue the record up, Les Elgard swinging down the lane. <laughs> da, 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 dum, 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 da, da. I still remember it. Hot May Day in Miami. Record's playing, I lower the music down, turn the mic on, and nothing comes out. I bring the music back up. <laughs> I bring the music back down, and, not, and I look at the clock. I remember it's like three minutes after nine, and I'm saying to myself, all my life I wanted this, and I'm scared, and I can't, I can't do it. I'm too nervous. So the whole thing is blown. 
And Marshall Simmons, the general manager, kicked open the door to the control room, and he said, this is a communications business. Damn it, communicate. I turned the record down, put the mic on, and I can almost remember it verbatim. Good morning. My name is Larry King. That's the first time I've said that because I've just been given that name. All my life I wanted to be in broadcasting, and this is my first day ever on the air, and I'm scared to death. <laughs> you said this uh, on air. I'm telling them. So I've got a new name. I've got a show to do for three hours. <laughs> first time on air. We'll do news in the afternoon. So please bear with me. Now, later, such greats as Jackie Gleason heard that story and Arthur Godfrey, Johnny Carson. They all said, you discovered that day what the secret is. What's there's, the secret? There's no secret. <laughs> Be yourself. Mm. If yourself is going to work, it's going to work. You can't grab the microphone or the camera and make them like you. I can't make someone listening to us now continue to listen. Yeah. So all I can be with you is direct, answer what you ask, try to be conversational, mm -hmm. and hope that that works. If it works, now I've had 60 years, so something had to work, right? <laughs> yeah. But I didn't go on planning that, boy, this is going to work or that's going to work. I just trusted my instinct. And every great broadcaster through the years that I've known, interviewed, admired, read about, trusted their instinct. Mm. Edward R. Murrow in World War II was unbelievable. Be in London during the bombing. <laughs> and I can remember, this is Edward R. Murrow, this is London. And you'd hear bombs in the background. And that's what I love about radio, because radio, you can paint a picture mm -hmm. that no one, Rod Serling once told me, the guy did Twilight Zone. He directed and produced all of Twilight Zone. And he used to write for radio. Mm. And I said, well, what's the difference? He says, well, when I write for radio, I could write, <clears throat> there is a long, dark castle at the top of this winding road that seemingly leads to nowhere little organ music behind you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you can picture that castle yeah. any way you want. Absolutely. You can picture that road any way you want. Yeah. If I do the same writing for television, they uh -huh. say, okay, Rod, what kind of castle you want? <laughs> we'll put the three-pointed castle at one point. You want a flat castle? So it becomes your ima the imagination of radio mm -hmm. is unmatched because you can use the power of the voice to do anything. Hmm. Now, it could take you anywhere. Arch Obler, the great director of Lights Out, Lights Out was a great, scary radio show years ago. I had him on my radio show once. <laughs> and he, I said, give me a description of radio. And he started to describe an insect crawling up my arm with seven legs <laughs> and a green face. A little hissing sound coming on. He's at your elbow now. He's climbing up the back of your neck. <laughs> All he had to do was that. Right. And he was sitting there, and I got scared. <laughs> you know, you're at home. He used to do a show, Lights Out. It began this way. Sunday night, 10 o'clock. Crawl under your couch. Turn down your blinds. Shut off the radio. And turn your lights out. God. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. <laughs> and th those were incredible days, and I benefited from all that. Mm -hmm. I benefited from all the drama, all yeah. the news, all the sports. I, when I listened to Red Barber doing baseball, I listened to Vin Scully's first game. Scully learned baseball from Barber. I learned baseball. For, I see Vin all the time at Dodger games. He's 89 years old. He's been doing it for 67 years. Wow. I remember listening to his first broadcast. <laughs> so there's something about, and that's a radio, baseball on radio. Yeah. You can create the drama because you got pacing. Mm -hmm. Other sports don't give you the pacing. You know, football. You got, you got timing the, in between, yeah. Yeah, you got that to build, you know, the anticipation. Red would, Red would tell you about the city he was in, what's in Cincinnati, and 
where the clouds are in the sky. Hmm. You know, the crowds coming in and the turnstiles. And really God. painted a picture. Yeah, That's what you do. Mm. You paint a picture. And so I can almost, Marty Glickman was a great basketball announcer. He was so good, I could see the game. I could see the game. He didn't need TV. Didn't did. need it. Hmm. He, found, he got every pass right, where the player was, who the player was, what it was. I just, he just knew it. And I... Did you do sports broadcasting ever? I did, I did. I did dolphin football for huh. six years. I did color. Uh, I did the perfect season. Wow. I, knew, I knew the greasies and the kicks and the warfields and the hmm. Manny Fernandez and Nick Bonacani and Don Shula as a friend. And who, who was the greatest, uh, your favorite sports athlete that you ever interviewed? It'd be a few. Ali would hmm. be way up at top. Ali was the best. No Did you interview him in his prime, or in his prime when he was uh, when I interviewed him when he won the Olympics. Wow, it's Cassius Clay. Yeah, he was not the heavyweight champion; he was the light heavyweight champion of the Olympics in Rome in 1960. He trained in Miami, so I was doing a local radio show. He came on, mm -hmm. then he came on my television show, then he was banned from the sport when he changed yep. his name. I remember the day he changed his name. I was at the weigh-in when he fought Liston. Wow. And he was acting crazy. I mean, he was going nuts. <laughs> yeah, you're going to fight me now, fight me now. And I met the medical examiner. And I said, I don't think he's going to show up because he looks, you know, crazed. The medical examiner said his blood pressure is normal. It's all an act. Amazing. It's all, his blood pressure was 120 over 80. Amazing. Um, he was, I well, put, put him it, way up there, but a lot yeah. of others too. Joe Namath was one of my favorites because he was always himself. Mm. Joe was great at that. But I, I've been fortunate to talk to Sam Musial. Yeah. A lot of football players, a lot of football quarterbacks. I learned a lot talking to sports people because, really? well, this, the athlete has something we don't have. Their career ends when ours begins. As Joe Namath, there was a book about Joe called When the Cheering Stops. I was with Joe two years ago in Cleveland. They had all the Hall of Famers there. Yep. He goes into a restaurant now. Some people recognize him, but my kids wouldn't know him. Right. The cheering stops. Yeah. So you get to be 35, 36 years old, it's over. Whereas, you know, my career started to blossom when I was 43. Right. You know, most of the, but, but, you know. And sure. the athlete faces another thing that we don't face, winning and losing. We do not have a daily final score. Right. We don't have it. You could have ratings, but they're every six months. And a, but the athlete, you go out to play. Every week there's a game. Every day in baseball. Yeah. What was the final score? You could have all these, 6-3, you lost. Right. They got six, you got three. <laughs> it sucks. Every day you feel great or bad, right? That's right. <laughs> That's what I love about, Shula told me once, he couldn't be a, he loved baseball, but he couldn't be a baseball manager because he couldn't stand and the best of teams losing 50 games. <laughs> right. But the other side is you come back tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Football, you got to wait a week. It's miserable. Come, so that, that's misery. <laughs> Hurts. For a week. You're yeah. a football player, football right? Football player, yeah. The pain of football. I got to know it hanging around locker rooms and mm -hmm. seeing pain, seeing seeing concussions, Yeah. which they now, of course, the movie football's, football's in long-range <laughs> trouble. Yeah. I wouldn't want my kids to play. Yeah, I'm happy they played baseball. I'm glad I got out. I'm glad I got injured in my wrist and not my head when I got my out. My stepson Danny, he still plays in the Arena League. Yeah, and the fear is, you know, you're going to get. I hate to see bodies getting hurt. The, the difference is in baseball, if anything violent occurs, it's an anathema to the game. If a guy gets hit by a pitch, blood is drawn, you, you feel terrible. Yeah. Football, you see that? What? Did he hit him? Whoa, what a shot. <laughs> yeah. Both helmets went to the ground. He hit him helmet to helmet. Whoa, great. <laughs> get back up and do it again. Right? That's right. Let's get, get back up and do it again. <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay. Who was the most fascinating interview of all time, if you had to choose one, or the most interesting person? <sighs> you're Impossible. They're all interesting, right? No, they're not all interesting, but <laughs> when you get to people like Martin Luther King, mm. Malcolm X, Frank Sinatra, mm -hmm. All the presidents, um, 
uh, people who are just everyday people, people who are fascinating. Uh, it's just, people fascinate me. Hmm. Why? Because everybody has something. I'll tell you, it's, I haven't told this in a long time. I'm in New York doing my television show, Larry King Live, and someone recommends you ought to book this New York City cop on. He's a captain. He's in the public relations area. Mm -hmm. He doesn't. He doesn't walk a beat. He goes around, talks to schools and groups. Right. So okay, we'll have my figure be another PR kind of thing. You know. Sure. And he comes in with a beautiful wife and a little son, except he's paralyzed from the neck down. Oh. He's in the wheelchair, paralyzed, neck down. And we're talking. You know, he's, his father was a policeman. His grandfather's a policeman. He would love his son, who was only two or three, to be a policeman. He can't feel his son. His son can kiss him on the cheek. He'd feel that, but he can't hold his son. Oh. So we get around to, listen to this, how he got paralyzed. He was a New York City cop, and they're working Central Park. And they've had a lot of bike robberies, the report. So the captain tells him that morning, look out for bike robberies. This tells a lot about our society. It relates to right now, too. Yeah. Relates, this story relates to right now. So he's in the squad car. They're driving through the park, and they see a black kid with a brand-new Schwinn. Schwinn bike. They pull over. The driver stays in the car. He gets out to approach the kid. Mm-hmm about the bike, and the kid shoots him. He, was right. he remembers the puff of smoke going up. Oh, man. And the ambulance comes. They give him last rites in the car, and he goes in, and he recovers, except he's paralyzed for life. Huh. Neck down. His child was a month old, his beautiful wife. He loves cops so much he wanted to stay, so he's doing PR in a wheelchair. And one day he says, I'm very, I really want to meet the kid that shot me. Wow. They catch the kid or? The other, he was right the there, the kid. other cop arrested. Gotcha, gotcha. The kid surrendered. Okay. And uh, he goes to visit the kid. The kid's in jail. I think he got 10 years or something, attempted murder. And he visits him. He goes into his cell and he says, why'd you shoot me? And the kid said, I'm an A student. My brother was a bad kid, and he'd left town to go to Philadelphia, and he said, hold my gun. I was just holding it. I didn't even know how to shoot a gun. I was just holding it. And I saved money delivering groceries for five years to get my Schwinn bike. Oh, my gosh. All I wanted was my Schwinn bike. And you were the 12th cop to stop me that day. Oh. So he says, Look, can I ask you a question? Would you have stopped me if I were white? And the cop said, I had to admit, I would not have stopped him. Wow. So the kid just reacted out of anger. And then the end of the story, you could cry is, the cop gets the kid paroled in his stead, and that kid, became a cop. No way. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so this could relate to today, blacks oh and gosh. whites and things. But he, his realization. Oh, my gosh. That what you understand about this kid had a new bike, which is all he ever wanted, and they kept stopping him. So what I always try to do is put you, and what he did, put yourself in the other guy's shoes. Yeah. Now, I don't say shoot everybody. Right. But in that moment of frustration, of feeling, my God, I worked for five years, saved up to get this bike, and they can't believe that I, a black kid, could have a bike. Hmm. It's a good lesson. Powerful, yeah. So that's what I mean by learning. Yeah. Every day I learn. I, I've interviewed so many people with so blind people. What's it like to be blind? Mm -hmm. It's fascinating to me. George Shearing was a great blind pianist hmm. who didn't want to see. He didn't want to see. He was blind from birth. And he said, I don't want to see because every girl's beautiful. Wow. Every girl's beautiful. Every color is bright. All days are sunny. 
In his world, right? In my world. He creates his yeah. own world. Wow. My own colors. I don't have to, I, I can envision what red is or blue or black. Now, Ray Charles was different because he had seen it. Uh-huh. He wanted it back. Hmm. He knew what he was missing. You interviewed him as well? Yeah. yeah. I've interviewed everybody. Yeah. Is there anyone you haven't interviewed that you wanted to? Fidel Castro. I would love to. I went down to Havana some years back, and we tried to get him because he fascinates me because he's had his he's led his country for over 60 years. Hmm. I think he's the longest-running leader ever. 60 years. And so. Um, forget politics. Somebody must like him. <laughs> yeah. You can't last that long. Wow. And then he took on a country 90 miles away, thousand times bigger than his. He, he was embargoed. <laughs> i tell you what I discovered. This. See, you could, you could look at things differently. Havana is a fantastic city. Hmm. The people are so happy. They're poor. Really? But music is through the street. You walk down the street and there's music. The hotels are jammed. People from Spain and Canada and Mexico and beautiful wow. hotels. The airfield, the airport is gorgeous. Hmm. The cars are all 1957 right. cars. Right. It's really funny to see. But they'll build hotels. They'll sure. Havana will be a major tourist stop. They'll wind up with a major league team in 15 years. Got a big population. Of course. They got great, great athletes. Number one sport yeah. is baseball. What would you say is the biggest lessons you learned about yourself over the last 60 years during this? From all the people you learned? Well, I tell you what I learned. As Bertrand Russell, the great philosopher, Nobel Prize winner, when he was 95 years old, they were having a dinner in his honor, and someone said, Dr. Russell, what do you know? What do you know? And he said, all I know is that I don't know. (laughs) And so I would say that to you. I don't know. Lou, the more I ask, I mean, I'm 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 wondered by all the things, but I I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what's out. We don't know if there's life on other planets. We, mm-hmm. I, I don't know if there's a God. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't have faith because I can't accept something. Mm-hmm. I've asked too many questions. I never got good answers. I respected all the religious leaders I've interviewed. I respect them. I respect yeah. the you know, religion, but I've never got an answer to the question of. Explain the Holocaust. Right. If you're omnipotent, you could have stopped it. Right. Explain the children dying. So, and the typical answer is we can't explain the ways of the Lord, which is a total cop out. You're speaking for the Lord. Answer mm. me. Right. You're his representative. Right. So that bugs me. Mm. It, but, but that's part of not knowing. I don't know, and I admire people that know. I'm married to a family that knows where they're going, they know they're going somewhere after they die. It's amazing to me. I wish I had that. I can't make that leap. It just makes no sense. Right. Huh. It, ma- it just makes no sense to me. It, ma- it makes, there's no logic to it. But it's a belief. Yeah. And you can't argue a belief. I can't make them believe. They can't me make me believe. They have to, it's a choice. I can't make them not believe. Yeah. It is a choice. Yeah. And you, you make that choice and. It's part of the world. More problems have been <coughs> caused by religion than of religion. There's a lot of a lot of pain and suffering and, and war. And everybody believes that. Like the the, you know, the guys who took that plane in nine eleven. They're believers. Of course. Weren't they? Of course. They believe they were right, and that we call was... them fanatical. Yeah. But they didn't think they were fanatical. Yeah. So they believed. Mm-hmm. How do we know they're not somewhere? I don't think they are. Right. But they believe they were. What? So all yeah. of life is a mystery to me. Mm-hmm. To have the answer to that mystery is amazing. I don't have the answer. <clears throat> I'm curious. Here's a question I've always been curious about people who have had this experience. I, my father is still around, but he had a very traumatic car accident when I was about 22, 23 years old that essentially he's not the same guy anymore. He's, I can't have a really emotional conversation with him. You know, we had to teach him how to read and write. He just has amnesia. He can't remember things. It's always the same conversation. It's just, it's not the support that I had growing up. It, he's there physically, but it's, he's just not the same guy. And uh, he can't work anymore, but he's getting better, but it's just still not the same. Um, and when that happened, I kind of always had this idea of after playing professional football, I would have like my dad to be there for me and this backup plan. And I'd go work with him and, I'd have the support, and when, when he was essentially gone, um, I kind of had to figure it all out on my own, and I had to 
It was like I didn't have a backup plan, and I was very driven from that point. And none of this would have been created in my life without that experience because it made me be like, I've got to step up. I've got to figure this out. I've got to do it now essentially on my own. I had support and mentors, but I don't think I would have been this driven in my life if my if father was still around, if without that experience of losing him essentially. So you used a tragedy. What's that? You used a tragedy. I, I used it to, to become better, to learn, to grow, to master myself, to – and figure out how to make money and things like that. What did, now I'm going to interview. What did that teach you? Um, that's a good question. Well, the, the question I was going to ask you was, do you feel like that affected you when you lost your dad to be this oh, driven? Yeah. To be this driven and where would you be maybe, without that? I, I, I always wanted to be in radio even when I was young and that. But sure, it maybe it, it, it drove me. But Do you feel like you'd be here now? Yeah, had I not gotten radio... I don't know what I'd have been because I had no skills. <laughs> I mean, well, I could talk well, like, but had I not found radio, mm -hmm. I probably would have been a stand-up comic. I had no college. Uh, Do you think so? You thought you would have still been in radio even if your dad was around? Yeah, probably. Yeah, still be in it. I don't know if I'd have been a success. You know that you never. Well, that's that's the old axiom we talk about all the time: left turn, right turn. I went out of the house one day and went into Manhattan. And a friend introduced me to a guy named James Sermons, who was head of announcers at CBS. Mm. And I said to him, I will really break into radio, Mr. Sermons. What do you recommend? He says, go to Miami. It's a big city, a lot of stations, no union. So there's either old guys on the way out or young guys on the way up. Mm -hmm. You're not going to run into a 40-year-old great talent. You're 22. Knock on doors. Right. I went down. Now, the question is, what if I didn't run into James Sermons? Then what? Where would I have How gone? How much longer would have taken? Or? Well, how much longer would have taken? Would, what, what, would there have been another? Now, someone told me. What would be your name? What would be your so, last name? That's right. Someone told me there would have been a different Miami. But if you have talent, you will out. You will mm. make it. If you have talent and passion for what you do. Someone asked me, what's the one trait all successful people have is passion. Yeah. They have a passion for what they do. How do they find it? We, I, that I don't know. <laughs> and they love getting up and going to work. Mm -hmm. In other words, they, they can't wait for the day to start. How, what about the people? I love the morning. Yeah. I, well, you do personally? Yeah. Oh, I love morning. Yeah. We had breakfast one morning. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if you remember that. But yeah. My wife spells morning with a U. She don't get up in the morning. She mourns morning. <laughs> she sleeps. Yeah. I, I, I like the morning. I like the day ahead. I like... I like having something to do. I hate it if I've got a day. What do you do? Nothing. <laughs> what, is, what is nothing? Right. Nothing to do. I love it. I love work. I love the feeling of accomplishment. Mm -hmm. I love the whole ball of wax. Yeah. And I don't want to. I don't want to die. Don't want to die. If I could, fo well, yeah. My wife said, "Well, if you were, if, if I were frozen, you know, cryonic." You come back in 200 years, she said, you wouldn't know anybody. <laughs> I said, I'll make new friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Start I, asking I, questions. I, I like living. Yeah. Uh, because of curiosity. Hmm. Who's going to win the World Series? Who's the next football championship? Right. How's Kevin Durant going to do in Golden State, right? Yeah. Uh, can the can Pittsburgh Penguins repeat in hockey? Who's going to win the election? Who's going to who? I'm curious. If you die... You don't know. You don't know, and you don't exist. Mm -hmm. You don't exist. Just that, your legacy exists, right? That's it. Yeah, I know, but for example, Sid Young was a dear friend of mine. He was a great I grew up with him, and he died last year. We just had a dinner for him the other night. Fourteen guys sat down to have dinner. We had one chair empty mm -hmm. for Sid. Mm. And we talked to Sid. We talked like, So technically, mm. we're keeping Sid alive. Right. And that made us all feel good until I said, you know, Sid doesn't know this is happening. <laughs> right. <laughs> We're keeping Sid alive, but mm. Sid ain't alive. Sure. But he's not feeling pain, but to not mm. exist and picture not existing for eternity. E Never coming back. Eternity. You ain't In this back. shape, form, whatever, yeah. You ain't coming back. If there's another life, you don't know it. You don't know it, yeah. And by the way, if you think there's another life, you can never be wrong because there is another life or you die and never know it. That's so it. you Never can't know. be proved wrong. Never know. It sounds like you are you don't know the answers to a few questions. Oh, I don't. So I'm curious if you could know 100% certainty of 
whoever, God, whatever, is like, this is the answer to that one question. What would be the one question that you would die to know the answer for? Do I go on? Sure. Mm. Because, again, I want to be around. I want to be curious. Yeah. I love to be a spirit. I, if I had one power, I'd like to be invisible. Why? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it at that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Leave it at that. Right, right. Okay. I could play shortstop. I could be standing behind a shortstop. I yeah. could fly in jet planes, <clears throat> right? Mm. I could visit actresses' homes. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah, think about that. Right. The, to be invisible is enormous power. You have all the money in the world. You go into private meetings and find out what stock they're buying. That's true. Can make it happen. Go to Vegas and take money. There you, <laughs> there you go. Put wow. it in your invisible pocket. <laughs> if, you, if you did know that we went on, would you do anything differently? If you no. didn't know that you lived on after this or... I'd be another... happy to hear it. I want to know I, how do I go on as, you know, what am I? Am I a spirit? Am I in a body? Uh, you know, what happens to my body? If if I die, what happens to my body? Where is the, right. There's so many unanswered questions. And, yeah. and for somebody who knows, so if I could know that, but I, there's no way I know I could know it unless someone who has died came visit me. Hmm. I haven't had that happen. I have never had that, you know, near death. I had bypass surgery. I had no near death experience. No, see the light. I no. didn't see no light coming <laughs> through the wall. I didn't. Right. I just. I. I don't. I wish I could. Who's the person you interviewed that you felt like knows the most, or has the most answers, or? Is the smartest probably uh, uh, the British guy who has Lou Gehrig's disease? He's lived the longest with it. What's his name? Stephen Hawking. Oh. Oh. Stephen Hawking with the black theory and the, uh -huh. the, the, he was fascinating to me. Yeah, because he types out all the answers, you know, because he mm -hmm. can't speak. But he, he's a, you know, he's a genius. Yeah. And, uh, I asked him, Stephen, what is something you know nothing about? And he said, women. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the universal truth. All right. <laughs> this I believe, and I don't want to. I don't want to hurt anybody out there because I mean this lovingly. Sure. I please believe me. I mean it lovingly. All women are nuts, <laughs> so, including my mother. You say it lovingly. No, you got to be honest. My sure. mother, my daughter, <laughs> everyone I know, they're all. If they could be more like men, I mean, men could be nuts, but extreme. But the average guy ain't nuts. Mm. He ain't nuts. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> if my forget, if my friend forgot my birthday, who cares? <laughs> right. <laughs> and they they have. I know that Venus and Mars theory. I accept mm -hmm. that theory. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest puzzle to me. Is women, women. <laughs> women and the way they think. Mm -hmm. Because they ha I know they think with a different part of the brain yeah, yeah. than I think. And it's really, uh, logic is not their word. <laughs> <laughs> logic makes makes no sense. Sure, know? sure. Okay. And I li here's the worst thing you get from a woman. All women do this. No man does this. No man does the following. You walk into your house and there's your wife and she looks sad, glum. Mm -hmm. What's the matter? Nothing. <laughs> no man would say nothing. A man would say, let me tell you. <laughs> right. Will you tell me? There's nothing the matter. <laughs> Will you look like you're... Stop it. I told you there's nothing. Don't speak to me. What are you supposed to do in those situations? I don't know. Have you figured out that answer? One of the answers someone told me is when you get up every morning, just turn over to your wife and say, I'm sorry. That's it. And you cover yesterday and today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry for anything I did and what I'm doing. Because whatever it is, she's got something. Wow. And just say, I'm sorry. Mm. So the 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 whole world is fascinating, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. And you you you're looking for greatness. Yeah. What is greatness? My definition. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you here in a second. That's the final question that I ask in the, in all my interviews. My definition. I think it changes over time. I think when I was a uh, in high school, it was to get a girl to like me and play college sports or whatever. But I think now, uh, as a 33 year old man. It's to discover and pursue my dreams and make the maximum impact in the world in that pursuit. That's what it is for me. And I think it's different for every person. It's not about how much money I make, but... Uh, yeah. I never sat down and examined it. I mean, I've been called, you know, I got a lifetime achievement from the Emmys. Mm -hmm. 
I've won Peabody Awards, which is yeah. our Pulitzer. And I know I'm good at what I do. Yeah. And people have said, you're great at what you're doing. I think greatness is to, in your chosen profession, exceed at being the best you can be. So you can be a great delivery man mm -hmm. for a milk company. You never miss your rounds. The milk is always there. You have you you never hit anybody. Mm -hmm. You can be a great garbage man. Yeah. You clean up the streets. You get it done. Another person could say, "I'm a great husband." That counted more than I'm a great family man. That counted more to me than anything else in life. Mm -hmm. To be a great family man. Yeah. But it's a word that gets bandied around a lot. You know, everybody's sure. great. He's great. He's great. He's sure. great. Um, yeah. That's a good definition, I think. Yeah. Uh, Jerry Jeter said to me, there are a lot of phony legends. <laughs> You're a true legend. That yeah. was a big compliment. That's nice. To me. The That's biggest nice. compliment I ever got was Norman Chad in the Washington Post, who wrote, to say that Larry King is better on television than he is on radio is like saying Mark, Al Mark Angelo. Michelangelo was a better sculptor than he was a painter. <laughs> Which I that that really that's true. Cool. But cool. it's great being with you, Lou. Yes. You have a great podcast. Thank you. You're Thank very you. thoughtful. I appreciate it. I've got a couple questions left for you, is that okay? Okay, Lou, you said forty five minutes. We have done almost an hour, <laughs> but I understand Lou because you're you're totally ingratiated with me and you feel I'm humbled. fascinated by you. I, I can tell. I'm fascinated. You, yeah. I can't get enough of you. All right, what else, Lou? Okay, a couple questions left, I promise. I'll make them quick. Um Biggest mistake you've ever made in your life? Smoking. I never should have started smoking. Mm. My father smoked. He died of a heart attack. I smoked the same cigarettes he used to smoke. Mm. Philip Morris. If I could have one day back in my life, it was the day I started smoking. Oh. Had a heart attack from that. Had bypass surgery. Stopped smoking the day I had the heart mm. attack. I was 53, so it's almost 30 years wow. that I haven't smoked. Congrats. And I loved smoking. <laughs> oh, I loved it. I smoked sure. three packs a day. It felt good. It was very sensual. Mm -hmm. The feeling was great. I'll tell you how, it, and I understand addiction. All people who are addicted, I understand completely. Addicted yeah. to drugs, you're addicted to drink. I understand addict because I was addicted to cigarettes. Yeah. Yeah. There was one night, I'm a single living in Virginia, northern Virginia, and I woke up in the middle of the night, a snowstorm, no cigarettes. I'm hunting, I'm on my feet on my knees, crawling along, going through the garbage in the house to see if there were any cigarette butts. <laughs> and there weren't any. Okay. Crawling on the ground. Crawling on the ground. I put on all the clothes I could think of. It's three in the morning. We I go downstairs, <laughs> and my car can't get out of the garage because the snow has backed up the you know, electric thing. Sure, open. sure. <laughs> I go out of the building, the Prospect House in Virginia, and I walk three blocks down a hill to the 7-Eleven, which is open 24 hours. I go into the 7-Eleven, go mm. behind the counter, take out a pack of cigarettes, open up, light them up before I paid. Mm. Shaking to light that cigarette up. The wind blowing in my face, my feet getting wet from walking in the snow to have that cigarette. So I understand addiction. Yeah. So I had a day back, it was the day I started smoking. Gotcha. Thing you're most grateful for in your life recently? <sighs> uh, kids. The fact that I got three grown, I got a great stepson in Danny, mm -hmm. and I got two kids who are 17, you know, at my age, mm -hmm. 17 and 16. Wow. I always tell the same joke. When people see me and my wife together, there's an obvious age difference. You know, they look at me, they look at her, and I know what they're thinking. You know, they look at me, they look at her, and I always say the same thing. If she dies, she dies. <laughs> <laughs> you know, life goes on. <laughs> But to have to, to have two young boys, 17 mm -hmm. and 16, they're both driving cars now. I no, can't believe cool. it. Crazy. Because they're still... See, when I see friends that I grew up with, and I have close friends that are still my friends that mm. I grew up with, they look 17 to me. I don't see them right. at 82. Yeah. They're 17. You know, so when I see my kids, they're five and six. Right. And I'm <laughs> taking them to their first Dodger game. And when I see them drive off in these monster cars going somewhere with all that engines and mm -hmm. these kids i i taught them i showed them how to drive right 
dick. It's 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 crazy. crazy. Huh? It's crazy. Just, I don't have kids yet, so I can I can only imagine. But I mean, there's nothing like kids. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. There's nothing in your life because suddenly you have the only thing in your life that is unrequited love. Mm. Unrequited. Your kid don't have to love you. Your kid can leave you. <laughs> right. But you love your kid. You yeah. love him more than a wife, more than his mother. You can't. You can't. There's no love like it because it's unrequited. Wow. As I've often said, John Kennedy's mother had a lot of pain. The same pain that Lee Harvey Oswald's mother had. Mm. One shot, one received a shot. Both mothers had the same pain. Wow. Right? Of course. Wow, powerful. A child can't powerful. Losing a child has to be the worst feeling, probably. I could not imagine. I've interviewed many people who've lost children. It's it's not right. Mm. Yeah. Steve Lawrence lost his son at age twenty three and and lost his faith, lost his religion, never got it back. It's tough. Could break you. Yeah. Okay, I have one final question, and I want to make sure I respect it. Uh, but where are we promoting? people too right now the course oh yeah larry's course you want a great com. course larry's course.com you'll get a course on on communication secrets of good communication interview skills all you'll those not things. only get 10 courses you get individual interviews i've done with special people mm -hmm. every month you get a new okay. one you, it's a great learning process it's a lot of fun it's funny yeah and at the same time you learn so oh. you go to larry's course.com yeah. You will not be disappointed. There you go. I guarantee and, this. And also, are you on social media anywhere, personally? Uh, well, I have Twitter. Twitter. I have two million nine hundred thousand Twitter followers. There you go. At Larry King. At Larry K at King's Things. King's Things. I think things. it's called King's Things. Okay. I don't even know what it's called. I have. Well, I have. <laughs> we'll link it all up. For I you. have this flip phone. <laughs> Can I see it? Can I? I haven't held one of these in ten it's years. It's heavy. Look at this thing. I'm gonna open it. Look at this thing. And I'll tell you why it's great. This is amazing. You know why it's great? Oh, why? Because you can't tell. It's a phone. <laughs> that's you it. You put it up to your ear. You don't have a phone. You're talking to a box. <laughs> true, so, that's true. And another thing, I know addiction. My wife, <laughs> totally addicted to yeah, that's her, good. Her, her iPhone. That's Total. good. Oh, yeah, Total. she's addicted to her iPhone. She's on it all day. Yeah. I see her sometimes sleeping, holding it in her hand, <laughs> open her eyes and start, start texting. Sure. It, I don't ever want. Hmm. See, cigarettes control me. That, that escapade of walking down that yeah. seven, they controlled me. Mm -hmm. I didn't control them. I had to go get the iPhone controls people. I don't want that. Mm. I don't want that. Yeah. I have to look at something. I'll learn. If something happened, you'll tell me. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? I don't, ha I don't need that. To look at it constantly, yeah. And I don't want something that, that controls mm -hmm. my life. I saw my wife and I were flying to Vegas once. True story, Danny. <laughs> we're in the car. We're coming into the airport. She goes, my cell phone. What about it? It's home. Well, we're only going for two days. She's freaking out. Uh, no, 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 no. I start shaking. I said, well, I've got a phone. <laughs> I've got a phone. It's not if the same you have thing. To, if you have to make a call. <laughs> no, it's not to make it a call. So i got to go home. I said, well, what do, you, what do you want me to do? She says, you go to Vegas, I'll take a she plane. She went home to get the phone. She went home, take a plane two hours later. Oh, my gosh. I wow. went to Vegas by myself. Wow. Addiction. Yeah. Uh, okay, I want to ask the final question. Now, you keep lying. No, I didn't ask the final question That's yet. part of the secret of good communicating. If you couldn't lie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was to promote everything you had going okay, on. Okay, that was good. Thank okay. you. Okay. Now, now, the final question, before I, I ask it, I want to acknowledge you, Larry, for a moment. Thank you. I want to acknowledge you for inspiring so many people in the world, for your incredible curiosity, and for uh, being a seeker of truth. I think you've opened up so much truth to so many people in the world through your questions, through your curiosity, through your generosity. I think listening and asking the right questions is very unselfish of you and very generous of you. As opposed to making it about you in every interview, you make it about everyone else. So Don't use the word I. Thank you. I don't use the word I. Yeah. yeah. So I want to acknowledge you for your incredible gift That's for showing it? up 60 years and constantly oh. giving and giving and giving and still having a youthful energy and uh, for being here. It just Thank you for your me. kindness, Lou. Yeah, of course. And since you've said that, it's about time I start getting back. <laughs> How much do I get paid for this? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Lou, there's no money? <laughs> no money. I'll what? get back. <laughs> People pay me lots of money <laughs> to do it now. Lou. How much you want? How much you want? All right. For you, 
seventy-five thousand. Okay, give me a discount. Sixty thousand. Got it. Okay. <laughs> Listen, you got a dollar for parking. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Thanks, Luke. Okay. Final question, though. That was to acknowledge you. <laughs> oh, gee. That was to acknowledge you. Okay. This is what I asked at the end. What is the answer? What is the answer? This is the the three truths question. If at the end of the day, all of your interviews are erased and gone, and you get to write down three things you know to be true about everything you learn in this experience of life, three truths that you would give to the world, what would you say are your three truths? Three truths. Nothing is given to you. Hmm. You have to earn it. That's my truth. Mm -hmm. Your truth. Of course, truth. if you have inherited wealth, that's, that's not your truth. But my truth is right. nothing's given to you. I was very poor. I was on relief. New York City bought my first pair of glasses after my father died. So I never forgot mm. poverty. We were <clears throat> poverty. Yeah. So nothing's given to you. Number two. Things will work out. What goes around, things will work out. Mm -hmm. Things look bad. They always work out. They work out. Yeah. I don't know why they work out, mm -hmm. but they work out. I have incredible belief in man, man and woman, the human. Mm -hmm. Nothing's given to you. Things will work out. And to quote Mel Brooks, <laughs> Don't chase a bus. There'll always be another. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> That's great. You run down the street, chase a bus. You miss the bus. You fall down. You get wet. There'll be another bus. There'll be another bus. There'll be another bus. <laughs> Thank King. you, man. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hey guys, Lewis Howes here, and thanks so much for checking out this video and this interview. I hope you loved it. If you did, make sure to leave a comment below and share this with your friends. Also, I've got a huge announcement. The Summit of Greatness is coming very soon. If you love the School of Greatness podcast, if you love these interviews and you want more, you want to connect with some of these speakers in person, you want to connect with me and other people just like you who watch and listen to these interviews, then make sure to sign up for The Summit of Greatness. Go to summitofgreatness.com to learn more. You can check out more about the video that we have that we created for the summit. There's a link in the description below as well. It's summitofgreatness.com. Check it out right now. I hope to see you there. And again, thanks so much for watching this video.